Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program. Today, I have my uh, partner in crime or in education, sorry about that, uh, Dr. Bill Lester, who's going to talk to us about diagnosing plant problems. And this is part one of a part two series um, because it's, there's a lot to talk about. And we were thinking that people just needed some guidance. You're out in the yard, you see a problem. Generally, what is everybody's first reaction when they see a problem with a plant, Dr. Lester? Water it. Water it, water it, water it, water it. If that doesn't work, then they wanna throw some. Fertilizer. Fertilizer out there on it. And then if that doesn't work, they'll grab something from the shed. <laughs> whatever they have in the shed and That's start right. spraying it. So we're going to, uh, somebody's telling me there's no audio. Um, if anyone else has a audio issue, <laughs> let us know. Um, we can hear each other. So as far as I know, yeah, if anybody's should... having an audio problem, if you put that in the chat, okay. Uh, Gloria can hear us. Okay. Um, yeah, um, if you're, okay, Eileen can hear us too. So um, if you're having an audio issue, it's probably, you know, on your end, something you need um, to look at there, or it's just the morning that it is where things don't want to cooperate very much. Anyway, Nicole. before before we get started, I was telling Dr. Lester you know, since he's talking to us about diagnosing, and I'm losing my uh, earphones here, um, <laughs> talking to us about diagnosing, and he is a doctor, I told him, I bet a lot of people don't really know what kind of doctor you are. <laughs> How You're not a medical doctor, not a human medical doctor. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't ask me medical questions. I can't yeah. help you with that. Yes. You're not an animal doctor. You're <laughs> nope. You are a plant doctor. And um, um, it is a real doctorate from the University of Florida. Um, it, it's a very um, esteemed program there at the University of Florida. And I was telling Bill, he doesn't think it's that uh, inspirational, but I do, because you didn't start this journey um, to become Dr. William Lester till you were, you know, you weren't 20. Let's put it that way. So. I'll let you tell your story a little bit before we get started. Yes, I went back to school when I was a little bit older. Um, I've lived over in Seminole County and went to um, Seminole Community College, it's now Seminole State College, and got a two-year degree in plant science and realized that I wanted to continue on and get a higher degree. So I transferred to University of Florida got a bachelor of science degree in horticultural science and had the opportunity to stay and go on through the doctor of plant medicine program, which is still a fairly new program at the University of Florida. There's been a lot more people since then who have gone through it and graduated, a number of whom work in other extension offices around Florida and really around the country. The people who graduate from that program end up working all over the world, really. <laughs> there aren't a huge number of graduates, but a, a pretty good number. And as a part of that degree program, I took a lot of graduate level classes in plant pathology, which is the study of plant diseases, entomology, which is insects, plant nutrition, um, just a wide variety of different areas. And the goal is to teach the students uh, and the graduates, how to diagnose and understand all different kinds of plant problems. So anything that could go wrong or adversely impact a plant or positively in, impact a plant to help it to grow better, produce better, grow more tomatoes on a tomato plant, that's what we cover. So today's class is absolutely perfect. It's going to be part one of what kind of different problems you could have with a plant. Because like Lily mentioned earlier, I get a lot of phone calls and people stopping by the office and emails with pictures and questions on Facebook. 
and I see other people's Facebook posts. And what happens is people will have a problem with the plant and they don't know what it is. So the first thing they do is they water, hoping that will fix it. A lot of times it doesn't. They put down fertilizer, hoping that that is going to cure the problem. Sometimes that can actually make it worse. It usually doesn't solve the problem. And then they start spraying whatever they might have in their garage or shed. And sometimes just by dumb luck, if you throw enough things out there, you may pick the magic one and solve your problem, but it usually doesn't work. So today, what I was going to cover, and let me go ahead and start screen sharing here. Um, there we go. Can you see that okay, Lily? Hopefully you can. I, I, can't, I can't see it, but that. Yes, I can. I'm sorry. I've got, okay. three I've got three monitors here now out here. But yeah, it's over there. Uh, yes. Okay. The cold weather always just seems to cause all these technical problems, I guess. Yes. So okay. today we're going to be talking about diagnosing plant problems. And this is just part one of a two-part series. So what we're going to cover today is all the different possible problems that you could encounter in your landscape with plants. And this applies to all different kinds of plants. This could be trees, this could be turf grass or your lawn, this could be landscape plants, this could be vegetables, this could be fruit trees, whatever it is. Plants have problems and there's a lot of different problems they have. Now in two weeks, we're gonna be back here to do part two and we're gonna go into much more in depth about how to accurately diagnose specifically what's wrong with your plant I'm going to kind of cover the questions that I ask people and the pictures and different information that I ask people to send me to help narrow down what the problem is and then some of the different solutions and controls for those problems. So today is just going to be kind of a, a more of a wide overview. And why is this important? Kind of common sense. You know, if you have a problem with a plant or your lawn or a tree in your yard, you can't fix that problem if you don't know what the problem is. I tell people if you go to your doctor because you don't feel well, the doctor's going to ask you questions, they're going to do tests, they're going to have you fill out forms, and they're going to figure out what's wrong with you before they start uh, prescribing medications or giving you treatments. They're not going to just, oh, here's a whole bunch of different things you can try. Let's hope that one of them fixes whatever your problem is. They don't work like that. And it doesn't make much sense for us to deal with plants in our yard and landscape that way either. Now, if you get it wrong, if you start doing the things like I went over and Lily went over about you water, you fertilize, you just start throwing whatever you have in your shed at it. There's a lot of adverse bad impacts of doing that. So if you don't diagnose your problem or diagnose it incorrectly, a lot of times what ends up is you have dead plants. So here you are doing, taking the wrong steps. Your next door neighbor says, well, why don't you try this? And it's not right. And now your long guy says, oh, no, no, no. You need to do this or spray this. While you're doing all those things, whatever is affecting your plant is getting worse and worse and worse. And a lot of times by the time we get a picture, the tree or plant or lawn is completely dead. And it's too late to fix the problem at that point. So very important that you do a correct diagnosis early enough where you can actually have an impact and an intervention and save your lawn, save your tree, save your bush. It's a whole lot cheaper than having to replace it. And you may not realize it, but if you start taking the wrong steps and just, if you go out there and I speak to people who say, I have a problem with my lawn and everybody in my neighborhood has problems with their lawn also. My next door neighbor started watering his lawn seven days a week. Here in Hernando County, you're only allowed to irrigate your lawn once a week. If you're caught doing it on the wrong day or too often or the wrong time of day, you may get either an encounter with code enforcement or they may write you a large ticket. If you need any information on how and when you're allowed to water your lawn, check with Lily, she has all that information. But if you start watering too much, you can get in trouble with code enforcement. 
if you fertilize too often or at the wrong time of year, that fertilizer can end up in our groundwater and our drinking water. Obviously, if you're out there spraying insecticides and fungicides and putting down treatments for grubs and all kinds of things that you don't really have a problem with to begin with, these are more pesticides that are now put out in the environment and they're gonna find their way into groundwater, surface water, into the Gulf of Mexico, and they're gonna have a lot of really bad adverse impacts. So the reason why we encourage people and we're teaching this is so that you can avoid making all those mistakes and putting all those materials in our water where we really don't want them. So in the world of different problems that you could have with your plants, there's two big groups or classes. One of them is called biotic. And these are things that are alive that will attack your plants and damage them. And we're gonna go through a whole list of different biotic things that can impact your plants. <clears throat> Other things that can impact your plants are called abiotic or they are not alive. This is something like cold weather. Last night, I live in Spring Hill and it got pretty darn chilly here. I think there was ice on the windshields this morning. So cold weather can adversely impact your plants if your plant doesn't like cold weather and that would be an abiotic problem. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what, what the lists of both of them are. So some different abiotic problems that you can have issues with and are going to damage your plants or affect them adversely. It could be too hot. It could be too cold. So if you're trying to grow tropical plants or things that can't take temperatures below freezing and they're out in your yard and it gets well below freezing and it does here in Hernando County and all over central Florida, some winters are warmer, other winters are colder, but eventually you're, we're going to get a freeze or a frost and it's going to get too cold. So those are things that can obviously impact your plants. If you're growing tropical plants or things that grow well in South Florida and we have a freeze, it could damage your plants. <clears throat> it may just damage a few leaves and do a little bit of minor damage that your plant's gonna outgrow pretty quickly in the spring. It could completely kill your plants. Another abiotic problem is if it becomes too wet or too dry. So in Hernando County, if you live in Spring Hill, as a general rule, where I live in Spring Hill also, we are very high and dry. So we have generally very sandy soils, very good drainage. But people who live in Brooksville, there are kind of wet areas there, or maybe you have a heavier soil. Maybe parts of your yard just naturally stay a little bit wetter during the summer. So you need to plant appropriate plants based on is the corner of your yard wet? or dry. Sometimes it's a little confusing because part of the year is wet, part of the year is dry. But your plant choice is gonna be very, very important for those areas. Um, and keep in mind, a lot of times when somebody has a problem with a dead or dying tree or other large shrub, one of the first questions I'll ask them is where your tree is growing, has, have you had a problem with flooding within the last couple of years? because what will happen is many trees do not tolerate flooding well at all. So if we have a hurricane or a tropical storm and your yard floods and is under a couple inches of water for let's say three days after the storm, if you have oak trees, pine trees, any kind of fruit trees, if they sit in standing water for one or two or three days, they will die. It may take a couple of years for that to happen, but eventually, it, the water damages the roots and it just sets this process in place where the roots become more and more and more damaged over time. <clears throat> and eventually the tree will start to um, look very bad and die. So very important that you know how wet it's going to become on your property or how dry. Another abiotic problem that we see a lot is people not realizing that they live in Florida now and you're growing plants and trees and bushes and vegetables and everything else in Florida. So I see it so many questions. People who want to grow lavender here in Florida, lavender does not do well in Florida. It gets way too steamy and humid and wet in the summer and that usually kills it. People want to try growing apples and pears and a lot of cherries, raspberries, 
Uh, and there's other things that grow very, very well up north. They're just not never going to do very well here in Central Florida. <clears throat> so are there people who can successfully grow apples here in Central Florida? Sure, a few people, but not many. It's going to take a lot of work, a lot of effort, and you may end up with a lot of disappointment. So try to focus on things that are going to do well and thrive here in Central Florida and maybe experiment with things that don't do as well here and see you know, maybe you'll be one of the successful few that's able to grow a decent crop of apples here, but realize that there's certain things that just naturally don't do well here in Central Florida. And that is going to be an abiotic problem because it's basically goes back to the Florida friendly landscape idea of putting the right plant in the right place. I've spoken with people who put in an entire row of azaleas out in the middle of their backyard, out in the full sun, and azaleas will never thrive and do well in full sun. They will get a lot of diseases, they'll get a lot of insect pests because the plants get very stressed and very sickly from too much sun. Azaleas need to grow in a partly shady kind of speckled sun underneath an oak tree location to thrive and do well. So always keep in mind the basics of, are these plants well adapted to Central Florida? Are they gonna do well here? Is my soil correct? Am I putting it in the shade and it really wants full sun? Did I put it in full sun and it really wants some shade? So look at all the basics first, because if you do really badly with the basics, you're setting yourself up for a lot of problems. So a few other possibilities uh, in the abiotic problem world, possibly your soil pH is just not correct for the type of thing that you're trying to grow. And a good example of this is Bahia grass. Bahia grass thrives and does best with a soil pH of about 5.5, which is somewhat acidic. Here in Hernando County, if you live in let's say Hernando Beach, your pH is probably 7.5 or as high as 8.5. Bahia grass never does well in Hernando Beach or in a soil with a very, very high pH. It may grow and do okay, but it's never going to thrive and look really, really great. And a lot of times you really can't do anything long term to change your soil pH. You just have to realize what it is and live with it. So, for example, if you live in Hernando Beach, and you get your soil tested and your pH comes back at 8.0, Bahia grass will never do well in your yard. Sorry, but there's not a whole lot you could do about that. You just have to live with that. You'll never be able to grow azaleas or blueberries or gardenias very well because they like acidic soil also. Can you grow blueberries and gardenias in a container in potting soil with a lot of, um, peat moss mixed into it to, to give it a lower pH? Sure, that's a possibility. That would do really well. But if your pH is too high, there's not much you can do to lo lower it permanently. If it's way too low, which we see sometimes, not very often, you can lime to raise the pH to get it to a better area, depending on exactly what you're trying to grow. Your natural nutrient levels are very important to know. So certain plants need large amounts of nitrogen. Other ones might need extra phosphorus or potassium. You need to know what you have naturally in your soil. So that is what you're going to base your fertilizer program on. So uh, unusual nutrient levels are an abiotic problem. And we have, <clears throat> I don't know if you've noticed this yet or not, but here in Central Florida, we have very sandy soil and there's not a whole lot of compost or organic matter in it. A lot of plants need a lot of organic matter to grow well and thrive and produce well. So you need to understand that up front. If you need to add or make compost, you could use black cow cow manure, you can use mushroom compost. All these different things are available by the bag at big box stores or by a truckload if you have a very large yard or you can start making your own compost and just work a lot of compost in the soil. Compost helps everything, but certain plants need a lot of compost or organic matter to do really well. They're never gonna do very well in very, very sandy soil. Other plants for people who might be interested in growing native Florida plants, 
They don't need a whole lot of organic matter in the soil. They're used to growing in just pure sand. They're native plants. They're native to this area and they thrive in the native soil, which is usually very, very sandy without a whole lot of organic matter. So understanding all those basics up front goes a long way towards avoiding problems and helping to understand a problem if it starts to pop up. So biotic factors, those living things that can affect your plants, plant diseases and bacteria and fungi, a lot of times to figure out exactly what they are, they do have to be sent off to a lab. So University of Florida has up in Gainesville, the University of Florida Plant Disease Clinic. And when I was still in school up at UF, I did an internship with the Plant Disease Clinic. And I actually mixed up media and poured it in these little plastic Petri dishes and took little pieces of leaves that people sent in and put them in it and put them in the uh, warming box for three days, kept them at about 85 degrees and fuzzy stuff would grow in the dish. We'd look at it under a microscope and figure out what it is. So I can't look at a plant disease and tell from just looking at it, the species of disease it is. And you can't either to find out for sure it has to be sent off. But most times you don't need to be that specific. If you have a plant and you have a fungal leaf problem, that's all you need to know. That's all I need to know. We don't need to know what species of fungus it is. Sometimes it helps. And I can give a pretty good, a pretty educated guess what it is. But to find out for sure, you have to send it off and put it in a lab and do all this difficult work with it. So starting with really, really large biotic problems in the landscape, you may have a problem with animals. So if you live way out in the country, we do occasionally get phone calls and emails about deer. Deer apparently are not really picky about what they eat. There's a few things they don't like azaleas, I think. They love hibiscus. If you live way out in the country and you have deer and you have hibiscus, the deer are gonna find your hibiscus. And it's, I think it's kind of like crack for deer. They really like it. So you may have a problem with deer feeding on your plants. Squirrels can be a problem also. They tend to just dig and they dig up flower bulbs. They'll uh, damage plants. Sometimes they'll chew on your tomatoes. They make more of a mess and actually eat a lot. Birds can be a problem if you're growing, especially strawberries or tomatoes, things that when they get st start to get ripe, they get colorful. Birds will see them and in the spring, they'll peck on them a lot to get the liquid out of it because it's very dry in spring. Birds get thirsty and they're gonna visit your tomato patch and damage your tomatoes to get a drink out of them. And they just damage and destroy a lot of blueberries and strawberries also. Voles can be a problem. A vole is a small gray or brown furry animal, looks similar to a mole, but moles live in tunnels underground. Voles live above ground and they are here in Florida and they can get in your garden. They can eat your vegetables. They can eat, um, I think they damage bulbs. Sometimes also they can damage a lot. Nematodes are microscopic roundworms that live in the soil. And most nematodes are beneficial. They eat fungi, they eat bacteria, they eat each other. Some of them are carnivorous and they eat other nematodes, they eat other things in the soil. But we do have a number of species of nematodes that will feed on plants and damage the roots. So a lot of times when you have a plant <clears throat> that has a problem with its roots and we'll look a lot more specifically how to figure that out in part two class. But as a general rule, if you have a problem with your plant and all of a sudden the whole thing from top to bottom wilts or turns brown or dies very quickly, it may be a problem with the roots because the roots and what the roots do, they take in water, they take in nutrients, affects the entire plant. If you have a bad root problem, it affects the entire plant and the whole plant will boom. All, it may die very, very suddenly, literally overnight. So one thing that could be causing root, major root damage is nematodes. But as we see when we get to fungi and other things, there are other things that can affect your plant roots too. 
Snails, slugs, we do have a lot of them. They tend to, their populations tend to go up and down, but you may have snails and slugs feeding on your plants. So people will say, I have a problem in my vegetable garden or my fruit trees or something else. And something in the middle of the night is coming along and eating them and damaging them. And all the leaves are gone now or branches are broken or whatever. What is it? <clears throat> really hard to say exactly what it is. A lot of times what you have to do is go out there and catch the suspect in the act. So if it's happening at night, you may have to go out there with a flashlight at night. There are things that only come out at night. Things like snails, slugs, a lot of animals are only active in doing damage at night. So you may want to go out there with a flashlight a couple times during the night. Um, people will set their alarms and go out in the middle of the night. You could set up a trail camera now or a ring doorbell. There's a lot of technology that you could put outside or in your garden and find out, do I have a problem with raccoons or deers or you know whatever it may be? in the middle of the night. Sometimes that's what you have to do to figure out exactly who the suspect is. <clears throat> so plant diseases. Plant diseases are a pretty complicated area. And I took a lot of graduate level classes on them, everything from fungi to uh, plant bacteriology to virology. And there are a lot of them out there. It's kind of a confusing topic but to kind of boil it down so that homeowners can understand it and figure it out. And so I can help you figure out what the problem is. It's pretty simple. So if you know a few basics, it's not that difficult to understand. But basically what a plant disease is, it's a result of some kind of dynamic detrimental relationship, think bad relationship between an organism that parasitizes your plant and the plant. So it may damage the cells, may damage the tissue, may interrupt the normal uh, biochemical processes that your plant has to go through to grow and be healthy and thrive and make flowers or fruits or whatever you're trying to do with the plant. The disease is interfering with that. Now, most plant pathologists, myself included, when we think of plant diseases, I think of some kind of biotic problem, something that's alive, that's parasitizing your plant. Other plant pathologists kind of lump the abiotic factors in there also. So they'll consider really, really cold weather, really hot weather, lack of water, flooding, things like that as diseases. I really don't, but you can. You know, we can kind of lump them all into one big pile of things that are going to affect our plants that can kind of all be lumped under the general heading of diseases. So when it comes to diseases, very, very important that you learn how to recognize and kind of wrap your mind around signs and symptoms. Because when you ask me what's wrong with my plant and start sending me pictures, these are the things I'm going to be asking you I'm going to be thinking, what are the signs and symptoms of what's going on here? And that's going to help me figure out what your problem is. So starting with the second one, a symptom is something that your plant does in response to something parasitizing it or something wrong with it. So a simple example is you have a plant outside and it starts to wilt. So that is a symptom of maybe lack of water. Your plant's really, really dry and you need to water it. So if you water your plant and it perks back up, you reverse that symptom and you've cured the problem. Your underlying problem was your plant was dry. The symptom it was showing you because of that problem was it was wilting and you watered it and you fixed it. That, that problem was pretty easy to fix. Signs are a little bit more complicated. Signs are actually when you're looking at the plant disease or what is causing the problem. Probably a good example of that would be if you have a palm tree in your yard and you walk out there one day and you see a mushroom or a conch, like a shelf or bracket mushroom growing out of the side of your palm tree, that is a really, really bad sign. That is a bad thing to see because your palm tree, if that happens, is a goner. What that is, is there's a fungus or a mushroom 
that's growing inside your palm tree, it's making the mushroom sticking out the trunk of your palm tree to reproduce. And that actual mushroom is a sign or a part of the fungus. So sometimes the black spots that you see on your leaves that are being caused by a leaf spot fungus, if I look at that under a microscope, I can see a whole world of stuff happening on the surface of a leaf. I see little things popping out of the surface of the leaf and they have little spores on the tips and they're growing and all kinds of things. Those are all signs of the disease because that's an actual part of the fungus that you're able to look at. So if your plant has a problem looking at signs, if there are any, if you can see them and you can't always see them, sometimes they're hidden inside the plant and you can't see it, but looking for signs and then looking carefully at the symptoms the plant is showing you, that goes a long way towards tracking down what the problem is. So with careful observation, and I've always been told that the most important tool you have for diagnosing plant diseases are these things right here, your eyes, just take a moment and look very, very, very carefully at the top, bottom of the leaf, the stem, the whole plant, top to bottom, get a magnifying glass, get a hand lens, look very, very carefully at everything that you're seeing before you start making any decisions or you start thinking that you know what the problem is. Stop and look and think about it first to help narrow down what maybe it is or what maybe it isn't. So like I said, a sign is an actual part of the organism. It could be a part of that fungus. Um, it may be a, a mushroom growing out of your plant, which is always a very, very bad sign to see. And then the symptoms are the effect that the pathogen is having on the plant or what the plant is doing in response to being sick. So fungi, fungi make up a very, very large, important part of plant diseases. Fungi have their own kingdom. There is a fungal kingdom that technically the scientists that work with fungi are called mycologists. So you learned something today. About 85% of all the different plant diseases that you're gonna see out in your yard are caused by fungi. Fungi can include mold, mildews, rusts, mushrooms, Mushrooms that pop up in your lawn are fungi. Mushrooms that pop up in your lawn are not detrimental to anything growing in your yard. If they're poisonous, they're potentially dangerous to children, pets, dogs, yourself, if you, you know, come in contact with them. So be careful with mushrooms, but they're not, if they're growing in your lawn, they're not damaging any plants. So fungi can be spread by a lot of different ways. They blow in the wind. So there's no way to completely keep them out of your yard. They just blow in the breeze and down the street and they magically land on your plants, your lawn, your leaves. They get spread physically. People do a fantastic job of moving fungi and other diseases from place to place to place through tilling soil, through cutting different lawns. You know, lawn services go from yard to yard to yard. People who prune trees and palm trees go from yard to yard. Very, very, very effective way of spreading fungi. Um, fungi, when they land on a plant, many of them are able to poke a hole in the leaf or stem or root or the part of the plant and infect it all on their own. They have ways of doing that. Most fungi really love it in high humidity, free water, which is water, water droplets or water standing on the leaves or the stems in warm temperatures. And what is the weather like here in Central Florida most of the year? High humidity, a lot of free water, a lot of rain and warm temperatures. So fungi do really well here and affect a lot of plants for most of the year. Right now, during the dead of winter, we have very low humidity, very little rain, cooler temperatures, and we tend to have far fewer problems with fungal diseases. That is not an absolute. Some fungi can do just fine <clears throat> and impact your plants and cause disease, even during the middle of winter, December, January, and February. But we have far fewer problems now than we do in, let's say, August and September and October. So keep that in mind. 
So fungi are diverse and widespread. Um, they're recognized and classified a lot of times by how they reproduce. Some fungi reproduce through mushrooms, other ones through rust. For anybody who grows figs, you will in the fall get fig rust. Rusts tend to be very, very colorful. So if you have a fig tree, you turn a leaf over and there's all these little orange spots or bumps on it, that's fig rust. And it's a bright orange and you can wipe it off with your finger and it spreads very, very quickly and easily from fig to fig and throughout your entire fig. So some rusts are very common. Conchs, a conch is a type of mushroom. It's more like a shelf fungus. For anybody who does a lot of hiking out in the woods, a lot of times you'll see mushrooms and conchs and things like that on dead fallen trees in the woods. So next time you're out there, look at dead fallen over pine trees and oak trees, and you'll see just a multitude. They're all different shapes and sizes and colors of conchs and mushrooms. What they do are they are all saprophytes and saprophytes feed on dead stuff. So there's a huge number of very important fungi that, that feed on dead fallen trees, helps to break them down, helps to recycle them. It's all part of the nitrogen and carbon cycle out in the forest, part of the cycle of life. So saprophytic fungi are very important, but about 8,000 different species of fungi are pathogens or pathogenic, which means that they will feed on and damage perf otherwise perfectly healthy plants and cause you problems out in your yard. So there's a lot of different ways they do that. Like I said, their spores can blow in the wind. They blow in blowing water. When it rains really hard, it's really windy. So think hurricane or tropical storm, things blow around in droplets of water. Uh, Rhizomorphs, which is an actual little piece of the fungus, they get spread by lawnmowers. Sclerotia is when a fungus grows on a plant and it knows that winter is coming, so it makes basically a resting spore. Think a seed, and they can fall off and lay and rest in the soil for some of them as long as 40 years. So for years and years, you have those spores in the soil, and if you plant a susceptible crop in that soil once again, three years from now, boom, the spores are going to wake up and attack your plants and cause a disease. So sometimes they can be long lasting in soil. So always be looking for signs <clears throat> and look for different symptoms of fungi and plant diseases. So some of the different symptoms that fungal plant diseases can cause they, like, like I said, because there are so many different varieties of them, they attack plants in a large number of different ways. Plants can become off-colored, they become weak, they become susceptible now to insect attack, they start to wilt, uh, they'll die back. You see the middle picture there, that little growing uh, tip of a plant, it becomes dark, discolored. A lot of times younger plants or little seedlings will just fall over dead because they're not large enough to withstand a whole lot of attacks so they die very quickly. Older plants can de decline over time. Fungi that cause problems with trees a lot of times will take a long time to do so. But in other cases, they can kill the tree literally overnight. Um, it usually takes more than one day, but within a, a week, your, your tree can go from looking healthy to all of a sudden all the leaves are brown and hanging off the branches. So happens in a variety of different ways. A lot of times if you have a root rot fungus, the roots can have brownish streaks, the roots are rotted and mushy now, and that leads to roots not working and the entire plant dying very quickly. So fungi can cause a, a wide variety of different symptoms. But as a general rule, what homeowners encounter most often and what I normally deal with in probably a good 80, 90% of cases are fungi that cause leaf spots or root rots. So a leaf spot, if we go back to this picture here, um, that middle picture where the little growing tip of the plant is discolored and black and brown, a lot of times on a leaf, you'll start to see a little brown or black 
or it might be purplish sometimes spot. And then the spot gets bigger and then you get more spots and all the spots get bigger and they all join together. And now the whole leaf is brown or discolored. Now the whole plant is discolored, it spreads. That is a fungal leaf spot. And if the fungus is something that's in the soil and affects the underground part, it's considered a root rot. So like I said, if your plant dies very quickly from top to bottom, boom, all of a sudden dies, it may be a root rot problem. We do see a lot of root rots, especially in late summer, after a rainy summer, if people are growing things in a spot where it's just too wet, or the soil is too heavy, or they've moved into a house and they never realized that in the back corner, when it rains for three days in a row, the water piles up and it takes another week to drain. So really, really wet soils, root rots are gonna be a lot worse. And hedge bushes, people who have older hedges that they mulch. And if you think about this, if you have a, a row of hedges, a row of viburnum hedges in your backyard, and every year you add some more mulch to it, that's a good thing. Mulch, Lily will tell you, helps to hold in the moisture, block the weeds. Organic mulches break down and add to the soil. Those are all very good things. But if you start to get your mulch too thick, now your mulch is five, six, seven inches deep. What can happen is water goes through the mulch moving down and your soil gets very, very wet and your soil never has a chance to dry out. So now your viburnums are growing basically in mud for a couple of months during the summer. And not all of them will get a root rot, but one or two or three or four in that whole row of bushes will all of a sudden, literally overnight, die from a root rot. So that's caused from excessive moisture. So you always want to look at, do I have good drainage? Did I over mulch? Is my spot in my yard just way too wet? Did we have a... Uh, a tropical storm or hurricane, and my yard was under four inches of water for a week, that's going to cause a lot of long-term problems. It may dry out next week and look great, but a month or two months or a year or two down the road, you may start to have problems that were caused by that couple of days of flooding. And there are certain things that if you grow them, you will have fungal problems. If anybody here tries growing roses, you have fungal problems. You will get black spot. You will get a whole variety of different leaf spot fungi that you're gonna to have to use a fungicide on and you're gonna have insect problems that you're gonna to have to use an insecticide on. Certain things are, are growable here in Central Florida. They're just very, very high maintenance. So some plants are literally guaranteed to get fungal leaf spots. Other plants, it seems like they almost never have problems with them. Um, Probably a good example of that is I have a fire bush in my backyard. I never have a problem with it. I, I know I have insects living on it. They never damage it. Uh, I'm sure that by the end of summer, I have a couple leaf spots out there on a couple of the leaves. Never bad enough to, to impact the plant, make it look bad, make it stop flowering. So certain plants just kind of push their way through and fight off diseases and have very, very few problems. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're trying to diagnose what your problems are. If you're growing a plant that is known to have just a string of never ending problems, you're gonna to have to do a little extra studying on that one and learn how to diagnose what the problem is. Bacteria, we do have bacterial plant pathogens that cause bacterial plant diseases. Bacteria have their own kingdom. There's a huge number of them. They can be very, very difficult to control but they're not nearly as common as fungi are. We see very few bacterial plant problems, although a couple of really major plant diseases are caused by bacteria. If anybody's familiar with trying to grow citrus, both citrus canker and citrus greening are caused by a bacteria and a uh, newer I say newer, it's been around for a number of years, but it's becoming much more widespread and more in the news right now. Disease of certain palm trees called lethal bronzing is caused by a type of bacteria that's spread by a very, very tiny insect, a little plant hopper 
that moves that bacteria on its mouth parts from tree to tree to tree. So there are bacterial diseases out there that cause huge problems. There's just a very small number of different bacteria that you would probably encounter in your yard. Bacteria generally can't get into a plant all on their own. They need help from an insect to poke a hole in the plant and kind of put it inside the plant, or they need help from us with dirty pruning equipment, dirty trimming equipment, because if you prune a plant with a bacterial problem, you go to the next one and prune it, you just gave it to that one. Go to the next one and prune it without cleaning your equipment, you probably gave it to that one also. So people move bacteria very well. And bacteria can get moved very easily by moving water. So water moving along the ground or blowing water, like in a really, really strong thunderstorm or hurricane or tropical storm, that can blow bacteria from tree to tree. Think citrus greening and citrus canker, that's how it well, that's how citrus canker gets spread, is it gets blown from citrus tree to citrus tree within the growth. So bacterial diseases can cause similar looking problems to fungi. They cause a lot of leaf spot problems. Um, they can cause cankers, which is a bad spot or rotted spot on a stem or a branch. Wilts, shoot blights, like I said, leaf spots. They do need some kind of natural wound or opening in the leaf to actually get into the plant. And a lot of times, there's not a whole lot of cultural control or a whole lot of chemical controls for bacteria, not a whole lot of bacteria sites to pick from, to spray your plant with. But like I said, we don't see them very commonly. And it's a lot of times if your plant has a, a really bad bacterial problem, there may be no control. Um, the best thing you do is cultural control. So for example, clean that pruning equipment. If you hire a company to prune your palm trees, make sure they clean their equipment. If you hire a lawn service to cut your grass, make sure they clean their equipment. That's a very good way to move bacteria and fungi also from yard to yard. So that goes a long way towards helping to prevent problems. So viruses, viruses are technically not even alive. Viruses are really complicated. They're technically not really alive, so they don't even get their own kingdom, but they are classified. Viruses are given names. They're broken up into big groups and smaller groups and even smaller groups and individual viruses. Um, Viruses are nothing more than a strand of either DNA or RNA surrounded by a protein coat. There are a few viruses that are very, very important vegetable crop diseases, so they have a huge impact on commercial growers. There are a lot of unusual viruses that will attack plants. And if you look really close, you can see the symptoms and actually identify it, but it doesn't actually harm the plant. So like I said, there's a few that will, that will flat out kill the plant, many others that just cause kind of unusual symptoms in the plant and don't particularly damage it. They just do strange things. So I don't really want to get too deep into viruses because like I said, it is kind of a confusing group of organisms, or not even organisms, group of things to speak about, but one very common one that for people who have a vegetable gar garden and grow vegetables that we see at the office a couple times a year. Um, and if we move up here, I know I have a picture, tomato yellow leaf curl virus. This is a virus that tomatoes are susceptible to, and it is moved from plant to plant and vectored by the silver leaf white fly. So white flies are really, really bad at moving a lot of diseases between a lot of different vegetable crop plants. And one that they move through tomatoes, tomato yellow leaf curl virus. And this picture does not do it justice. I've seen people bring plants into the office. And I know if they walk in with a tomato plant and it's like neon screaming yellow, it's TYLCV, tomato yellow leaf curl virus. So what this does is it makes the leaves very, very yellow and very, very tiny and stunted. <clears throat> and the thing is for, let me go back here. With viruses, there are no cures 
for viruses. So if your plant gets a virus, there are no, I guess it would be a virus side. There's nothing you can spray, no control, nothing to get a virus out of a plant. You either have to get rid of the plant or live with it if it's a virus that's just going to do unusual things to the plant but not kill it. So here's some pictures of viruses. Now you need an electron microscope to be able to see a virus. So you'll never see signs of a virus because none of us has good enough vision where we can actually see that virus, but you will see symptoms or things that the virus does to a plant and symptoms that the plant shows you that it has a virus in it. So there's uh, about 400 different viruses that infect plants. Believe it or not, most plants have at least one virus that they are susceptible to. And even weeds, native plants, all the stuff that grows alongside of the highway and out in the woods has viruses. And if you're really, really into viruses or a virologist, you can go on a hike through the forest and you're picking them out, this one and this one, things that nobody else would ever really notice. Like I said, very few of them really impact homeowners except for some of the vegetable garden viruses. The infection remains forever. It doesn't go away. There are no sprays, nothing you do to fix it or make it go away. Viruses are always transmitted from plant to plant by living factors. That could be an insect, mites, nematodes. There are a few nematodes that transmit a few viruses through the roots. Fungi can actually help to spread viruses and People, people do a fantastic job of spreading viruses too. There's other non-living things, uh, rubbing or abrasion, mechanical means, plowing, pruning. Once again, pruning and trimming with dirty equipment is a very good way to help spread disease or viruses. And there are a few viruses that are actually transmitted in seeds. So you can buy seeds and the seeds can be... Um, infected with the virus, when you plant the seeds, the plant's gonna grow up to have the virus in it. That very, very rarely happens. There have been some instances in the past that the only people I can think who that ever really impacted was commercial watermelon growers a number of years ago. So from a homeowner point of view, that's probably never gonna be a problem for you. So like I said, the only one that we really see sometimes at the office during the summer is going to be the tomato yellow leaf curl virus. There's a couple other viruses that you can get on tomatoes and peppers, watermelons, summer squash. They get a lot of different viruses, most of which are spread by white flies. So I'd like to remind everybody that a little bit of learning goes a long way towards helping people learn how to properly diagnose and identify and control problems in your lawn and landscape. We do have a, um, a YouTube page through Hernando County government, and I have a link handy. As soon as I get out of screen sharing here, I'll go ahead and share that link with you so that you can go. Lily has a playlist with all of her different classes on there. I have a playlist with a number of my different classes on there. And this class, when we're done recording it in a few days, will find its way onto the Hernando County Government YouTube page also, as will part two coming up in two weeks. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for that class. But the nice thing is if you're busy or if you can't join us live, it's recorded so that you can still watch and still get the information. And every Thursday morning at 10 a.m., we have our virtual plant clinic. So I am on there almost always with Lily. Sometimes she has another engagement every once in a while. I have one too, but we're pretty much every Thursday at 10 a.m. we're on there and I have a link to this coming Thursday's virtual plant clinic. We are on Facebook live and we're also on YouTube live. So in a moment, I'll go ahead and share the link to this coming Thursday's YouTube live class and you can tune in and you can ask all your questions live and if I don't know the answer, and if Lily doesn't know the answer, we'll find it out and we'll figure out one way or the other. So 
Lily. I think yes. that's about all I have. I had no idea how I was doing time wise. I was kind of shooting blind there. You did great. Um, you're exactly at an hour right now. I was fascinated. Um, Bill and I spent a lot of time together. And, you know, so when the other one's talking, sometimes, you know, we've heard it before. But this particular class, I was very, very fascinated. So thank you very much. Um, rhizomorph is my new word of the day. Can, can we can we start a band, Bill Lester and the Rhizomorphs? <laughs> we need to start having vocabulary words. So every class <laughs> will go over a list of vocabulary words you're going to learn. And the most important thing is, um, and I learned a lot of this, what you're teaching years ago with Master Gardener training and in college. And it, you know, unless you're like you, it doesn't <laughs> always stay um, in your brain until you hear it again. So the best thing, the best takeaway is you don't have to remember every single thing that Bill said today because you can watch this again. And more importantly, he's there to help you. Your county extension office is there to help you. Um, you can add your, did you add your email, Bill? If you go out it to- It was at the end of my, it should be at the end of my presentation. Oh, okay. Well, it's W less- Well, I'll go ahead and put it in the chat room anyway. W. Lester at ufl.edu. You go out in your yard and you're looking at one of your plants and you don't quite know what's going on. Bill says there's never enough pictures. Take your phone with you out there. Picture, 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 picture. Maybe sometime. No such we'll do, thing as too many pictures. Maybe sometime we'll do a little presentation on how to take good pictures to send to you. And um, email him and we will try and figure it out. You can even take samples to your county extension office. If you don't live in Hernando, um, there should be one <laughs> in your county where you are. And um, a lot of times, they, if it's very common, they're going to diagnose it right there on site for free. Um, sometimes if it's a little more complicated, and then it might have to go to the university, um, and there will be a cost involved with that. If you, know, if you really need to know what I do, <laughs> is you know the part of the plant that starts looking bad i have my pruners i prune it off i put it in the kitchen trash and i throw it away that solves 90 percent of my problems <laughs> don't have to know its name just separate it from the rest of the plant but sometimes it's more aggressive or it's more um of a problem and you want to find out exactly how you know, and the important part is right care for the right problem. Exactly. Yes. And that's something that we're trying to encourage people to not do is what we described at the very beginning. You have a problem with some, it could be your lawn, it could be a tree, it could be any plant that's outdoors. If you just start throwing the kitchen sink and everything in between at it, we want people to avoid that. And before you throw anything at it, have at least a good basic idea of what the issue can be. Because, this, because as I've touched on just a little bit today, and in two weeks, we're going to go into more in depth. If you look at the entire toolbox of ways that you can either control or cure or prevent plant problems, it's a lot more than just your irrigation system and the sprays that you have in your shed. Right. Those are only two little tools in a great big toolbox, right. all of which you're going to need to draw from at one point in time or another. Okay, well, I don't see any questions in the chat. I don't know if you have any directly to you. <clears throat> um, I don't see either, any. Either you explained everything so incredibly well or everyone's mind is a little bit blown <laughs> like my but we can always come back to you for more follow-up. And that's what your county extension office is for as well. So I think we've done very well with that. And I thank you uh, for um, joining um, us, Dr. Lester. Eileen is asking about the YouTube link. I don't really have a link um, for it. There's no friendly URL that exists for it. So the link is this long. The best thing put you can it do in the chat box. Okay. The best thing oh. you can do is go to YouTube and look up Hernando County 
government, not just Hernando County, but Hernando County government YouTube. And you will find I have um, I have a playlist different than Bill's. You can certainly look on both and you'll be lost down a rabbit hole for days, <laughs> learning all sorts of. There we go. I, okay. I shared it with everybody. Okay. I think I didn't share it with everybody the first time. <laughs> www.youtube.com.hc government. Yeah. But I have it saved, so it's easy <laughs> to go to. <clears throat> Yes, and don't forget tomorrow morning to watch Bill and I's virtual plant clinic. That is always a lot of fun. That one is never um, pre-planned. We don't know what kind yeah. of questions we'll know we're going to get. get. Yeah. Poop always comes up. I don't know why. <laughs> but, um, we always find something to talk about for an hour. Yes. Yes. And we always yeah. get at least some questions from people. So that's if you have questions, Go on a virtual plant clinic and get them answered. Because if you email me, I'll get back with you. I'm, I'm sorry if anybody here has emailed me recently and it seems like I take forever to get back to you. If you try calling me, you may or may not get a hold of me. If you catch me live on the plant clinic, you kind of have me cornered. So, <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us and um, look for this. Um, Bill, I believe you have control of this one, so it's going to be on your Facebook page and then very soon on YouTube. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.